Heute Kultur 21 Spezial. Frauen sagen Time's up, es reicht. Muse Maestra Me Too und die Folgen. Wie verändern Frauen die Kultur? Sind wir am Beginn eines neuen Zeitalters? Darüber reden alle, wir auch. Kultur 21 Spezial mit Karen Hampstead beim Global Media Forum der Deutschen Welle in Bonn. Die große Debatte mit Frauen aus vier Weltregionen, die klar Position beziehen. Ladies and Gentlemen, thank you a warm welcome to this special edition of Arts 21 at the Global Media Forum today here in Bonn. My name is Karen Helmstead and it's a great pleasure to be here. Eight months into the post Me Too era, we've seen it spawn countless other protests, most notably the Time's Up campaign. And the interesting thing and striking thing about these protests is that they started in the cultural sector, which raises, of course, the questions, how powerful is culture? How powerful are women in culture? In the wake of Me Too, Time magazine made The Silence Breakers, its collective person of the year for 2017, saying their actions unleashed one of the highest velocity shifts in our culture since the 1960s. Well, we'd like to see just how much that statement can hold up. Can this movement empower women globally? Or are we, with our Western perspective, perhaps overestimating its reach? And here are my guests from all over the world, the renowned Indian feminist author and publisher Urvashi Bhutalia. She spent her entire career bringing women's stories and subjects like sexual violence into the public discussion. And she says the women's movement in India is one of the strongest in the world. Please give her a warm round of applause. An award-winning poet, publisher, and journalist from Lebanon is with us today, breaking taboos and sparking discussions of women's sexuality in the Arab world are her main beat since many years. Most recently, she ran for a seat in the Lebanese parliament. Welcome, Jumana Haddad. Okaya Diallo is a French journalist, author, filmmaker, and activist. Such a long list, I can hardly uh, uh, read it all. Uh, has published Racism, a Guide, and she's very outspoken on issues of freedom of expression and how, in her experience, harassment can be closely related to racism. A warm round of applause, please. <laughs> And last but not least, Ellen Harrington is an American curator and film programmer. In January, she took over as director of the German Film Institute in Frankfurt for over two decades. She worked for the Academy of Motion Pictures, Arts and Sciences in Los Angeles and, as such, experienced the Me Too debate at very close range. A warm welcome to all of you. Round of applause. Thank you for joining us, for coming all this way. And thank you very much to our studio audience. Now, meanwhile, ladies and gentlemen, rather than fade out, Me Too continues to have an almost daily ripple effect in the news. And so before we get started, we're going to have a quick recap of the turbulent times of Me Too. Frauenprotest in Chile, seit Wochen. Ein Aufstand, wie ihn das Land noch nicht erlebt hat. Gegen Sexismus, Gewalt. Haben wir das etwa ihm zu verdanken? Harvey Weinstein, abgeführt in Handschellen. Einst mächtiger Filmboss, jetzt angeklagt wegen wiederholter Vergewaltigung. Er herrschte über ein Kartell des Schweigens. Vorbei. Die Scham, das Schweigen. He led me to his bathroom, pleading that I just watch him masturbate. Die Zeit war reif. Es folgte ein weltweiter Aufschrei, eine Flut von Enthüllungen. Die schwedische Akademie in Stockholm verkündet, der Literaturnobelpreis fällt dieses Jahr aus. Die ehrwürdige Institution ein Scherbenhaufen. Gestolpert über einen Skandal um sexuelle Gewalt. Kultur, Politik, Wirtschaft. Frauen klagen an, Männer gehen. Scheinbar gibt es keinen Halten mehr. Auch wenn manche hoffen, der Spuk sei bald vorüber. Irrtum? Wagen wir einen Blick in die Zukunft. Was werden wir in 5, 10, 15 Jahren sagen? Was bleibt von diesem Aufschrei? Me too. Time's up. 
Definitiv wohl das. Ein Film von Hollywood-Regisseur Brian De Palma zum Fall Weinstein. Er arbeitet gerade an einem Drehbuch zu diesem Horrorstreifen. And we are uh, definitely not going to put that one at the top of our to see list, I'm pretty sure. But just back from LA, Ellen Harrington, uh, you spent 25 years at the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, so in the middle of Weinstein's world, so to speak. How did you experience the Weinstein affair and the ensuing Me Too debate? Well, what I think is so fascinating is that what the journalists who discovered this story and got the women to go on record with the New York Times and the, um, the New Yorker magazine did was they broke through a, a cartel of silence and an actual system of intimidation that was incredibly pervasive. And ironically, Harvey Weinstein's attorney last week stated that his defense was that he didn't invent the casting couch. And it's true, the entire history of the industry, of the movie industry, um, entertainment in general, um, women are a product and generally men are the architects of what's being shown. And it's always, unfortunately, been this way. Ironically, in the silent era, there were more women directors and writers than there are now. Um, and so when you look at the, the statistics and who's getting to tell the stories, mm -hmm. what I'm really hoping is that the normalization of that kind of institutional sexism and abuse, which really, you know, from top to bottom, people really did know about this. And journalists tried to break that story for decades. And there was a conspiracy of silence and a lot of intimidation tactics, actually, to prevent it from being told. I'm hoping this flips the script and that the new normal and the new normalization is that women do get a seat at the table and they do get to start being the architects of stories that are told in the culture. Are we seeing any changes already? What's the atmosphere now? You were just in LA. It's very different than six months ago, I will definitely say. Um, in terms of who the agencies are submitting for director um, jobs, looking at the actual hard facts that, you know, there's 3% of films that are shot by women in the cinematography department. Nine the numbers are astounding. Ridiculous. 9% of the top 250 films made in Hollywood last year were directed by women. And when you see films like Black Panther, for example, that not only address strong women roles, but you know minority and, and diverse performances, those films actually get a very high amount of of profit and a very high viewership compared to their investment. And the people in charge in the industry have been ignoring the business facts in order to stay comfortable. So have we, I think we've been seeing some change though at some of that, for instance, Cannes Film Festival, the Berlinale in Berlin, we're seeing actually a rise yes. in uh, what's being bought up by the production companies of, of female-driven narratives yes, already. And, and absolutely having Kate Blanchett and that group of women on the jury in Cannes, um, all of the you know, the staging of a protest on the steps of the film festival. It is actually changing business practices. Um, the inclusion waiver, mm -hmm. um, which is something where um, if someone has power in the industry, a, a strong cast producer, they can actually require that there's a certain amount of diversity in the below the line cast and in the, um, the staffing of the production. And it makes a difference. When women are in charge, they hire more women. When um, a diverse group of people are in charge, they hire more diverse people. And that's how you get more representation in the industry. People need the door open. They need a job opportunity. Okay. Now, you've been six months in Germany. It's not a long time, but I'm sure you have some impressions. You've been, uh, you've been dancing at a lot of weddings. So uh, tell us how, how you see things here. Is, is the industry yeah. moving here? Well, Germany already has a very different funding model, mm -hmm. and there's a lot more women directors here mm -hmm. um, and when, women who are getting here, their here. films distributed <laughs> um, you know, in narrative as well as documentary. Um, and the cultural political scene here is addressing Me Too quite directly. Um, certainly at the opening of the Berlinale and also at the Deutsche Film Prize, the awards commentators and also the presenters and the government ministers who spoke very specifically addressed Me Too and Time's Up and said it's a big part of their agenda to make sure that this doesn't fade away. Okay, so a, a relatively seismic shift in the U.S., I suppose we can say. Yeah. Me Too, of course, started off as a protest of well-to-do Hollywood stars, but very quickly achieved a global dimension and across multiple industries. Uh, how relevant was it in your country, Urvashi Butalia? Because I'm thinking women in India are also looking to, to some other moments in history as, as perhaps more seismic. Yeah, for us, actually, what you're now calling the Me Too moment in the West... Mm -hmm wasn't uh, what you addressed in your introduction, a ripple effect of what's happening in the United States, because much though, you know, I respect what the United States is doing in many respects, 
but it's not the center of the world from where things ripple out. Mm -hmm. And there are things going on in other parts of the world which are born of the local histories. So for us, actually, it was in the early 90s that the process of giving a name to this really widespread problem mm -hmm. began, uh, and it began because of the history of a poor village woman who, while performing her task as a government functionary, was raped in the village where she was working by four men. And uh, they raped her because they didn't like her trying to stop child marriage. And it led to a huge debate inside the women's movement about what comprises the workplace for women. Yep. Is it just the four walls of an office space or is it out in the fields, inside a domestic space and so on and so forth? And thus began the battle. Uh, we filed a petition with the government of India to bring in place a law on sexual harassment in the workplace. That came in 2013, after which it has become mandatory for all businesses, universities, educational institutions, everybody who has more than 10 employees to have committees in place and to deal with the subject. And that has coincided with a, uh, a sort of expansion in which women who are coming out into the public space and facing discrimination and seeing how male bias operates in the public space, they are speaking out more and more and demanding change. So it's a very live subject. It's everywhere. Of course, it is and the... Of course, yeah, the a, lot of, a lot of women to address the subject. Yes. And the, the momentum yes. is, yeah. is possible. And the articulation of it is, of course, with literate and urbanized women who can speak out and who have access. But it's not to say that poorer women in India are not complaining of the lack of safety and lack of security in, in working. So it's set to be a big movement. Let's see what happens. Okay. And it's very rooted in the culture of the home being the women's space and the public space belonging to men. Okay, thank you, uh, Urvashi, for that. Let's come over to you, uh, Jumana. We're talking about 500 million women in India, quite a, a much smaller number uh, in Lebanon. How relevant was Me Too in Lebanon and has it, has it had an impact, a tangible impact? Well, I personally uh, didn't feel a real impact. Obviously, there has been people talking about it, uh, but to tell you the truth, um, even though I know that healing starts with breaking the silence. This is the first most important step in any culture, in any problem. But uh, we still lack the courage to address this issue in a very open, open way. I mean, I know that uh, sexual harassment is widespread, that sexual intimidation Mm -hmm. is widespread as well at work because, you know, harassment is a very broad word. Mm -hmm. What does it mean? Does it mean my boss trying to intimidate me into doing something just because I'm afraid to lose my job, which happens a lot and many times in, in my country and in other countries? Or does it only mean, you know, touching someone or, uh, you know, it's about power. It's a power play. The fact that you say it makes it easier for others mm -hmm. to say it as well. But unfortunately, it always takes a famous person to say it in order to... It's a lot of... Well, there's an incredible because, amount I mean, of shame if, if associated. If it were like a waitress being harassed by a, a bar owner in, mm -hmm. in, in, a, in a small um, American town, mm -hmm. we wouldn't have heard about it maybe as much as we did because of who Harvey Weinstein is and who the actresses are. Yes, exactly. Rokaya Diallo, I'm going to come over to you because uh, the, the reaction in France, in this, initially in France, a rather uncomfortable backlash. Can yes. you tell us about that? Yeah, so there was uh, a kind of uh, discrepancy between the reaction that you could see on social media among the younger generation of feminists and the generation of the most famous French actresses. Balance ton port. Yes, there was, so there, was, uh, there was a journalist named Sandra Muller who started the hashtag Balance ton port, which was mm -hmm. a local the translation, translation of, of the Me Too movement. Mm -hmm. But there was also a column that was written by several actresses, including Catherine Deneuve and many of yes. many other... Catherine uh, Millet. Yeah, Catherine Millet, uh, Elisabeth Lévy, and some other leading uh, French women who were saying that they... who were 
rather supportive uh, to men and saying that they were defending the freedom of bothering, of annoying uh, women in the public spaces. So that was quite um, difficult because they have a wide echo out of France. So it was difficult for us, French feminists, to say that we, you know, there was not an unanimous voice against the Me Too in France. But I have to say that before the Me Too movement in France, there, there have been a kind of first wave of uh, reaction uh, um, related to something that happened to a woman. It was in 2011 when Dominique Strauss-Kahn yes. oh, yeah. was running for, uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, for the French presidency, was, was you know, involved in a rape uh, in New York. That was something that really had a, a, a wide echo in France that made us understand that, many, that, 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 that there was uh, much solidarity between uh, some uh, men that were standing with Dominique Strauss-Kahn. But to me, it was the start of you know, a new generation of feminists to raise and to, be, to go public. And the Me Too movement uh, finally make peop made people able to say and to prevent Roman Polanski, for, for example, hosting a very prestigious ceremony uh, in cinema. Exactly. Now, you mentioned, obviously, famous people need to speak up. In France, of course, we also just saw the protest, the protest of very high-profile women in film. And black actresses also took advantage of the Cannes Film Festival to stage a protest, which was also widely reported. Um, Rokhaya, do you think Me Too, as we see it become more and more inclusive, can be leveraged for more change in terms of women of color, women and women of color being taken seriously in terms of, in, as artists, as, as creative agents, is it helpful? Uh, I think that the Me Too movement is attached to celebrities. Made me, about yeah, Burke. Yes, yes, it means that there are some women who do the work on the ground at the grassroots level yeah. and who are not acknowledged by exactly. the, you know, the media. And we really need to, 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 to say and to tell that it's thanks to them that we're here today. And the, 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 the Me Too movement can really inspire a very diverse type of women to kind of um, tackle mm. their very specific position as uh, being you know, women, whether they're gay, whether they're women of color or you know, disabled women, women or other kind of women. I'm just wondering if, if there are thoughts on why the time was ripe, was so ripe now for this to just take off the way, it, the way it has. Yeah, but before that, I would like to say one thing, because you mentioned that I was saying that more famous people should uh, have the guts to speak up. And I was actually saying the opposite. We should pay more attention to regular people speaking up. I think this exactly. is why the yeah. media is very important. Unfortunately, they seek, without generalizing, the sensational part of any story. So an act Actress, a famous actor saying that, that this producer harassed me or raped me is way more sellable than a regular person, a regular woman saying that, while it happens every day to regular women. And they do try to speak up, but no one is listening. So it's very important for us to learn to listen and not just link, give importance to those who are famous, to the shiny part of any story, because it also deprives it of its uh, strength and of its, uh, uh, you know, um, depth. I mean, of course they have suffered. I mean, all these actresses have suffered. But in a way, and I'm going to be the bad woman saying that, they also have waited all these years in order to speak up while it would have been way better to many others to just say to no at the earlier. beginning. I'm not, I don't want to blame the victim, but I have to speak about a certain responsibility. Thank you very much for that comment. <laughs> Thanks. A round of applause for that. Now, Me Too obviously was all about speaking up, and Jumana, very early on and long before Me Too as well, you were breaking taboos and bringing the body and issues of women's sexuality into the conversation in the Arab world. Not an easy task. Let's have a quick look at this. Ein Tabubruch in der arabischen Welt. Die Kunstzeitschrift Jazad feiert den weiblichen Körper, die weibliche Sexualität. Jumana Haddad, Gründerin des provokanten Magazins, fordert Selbstbestimmung für die Frau. In der Weiblichkeit, Erotik liegt für sie die stärkste Kraft. In ihren Büchern räumt Haddad auf mit dem traditionell arabischen Frauenbild. Sie sagt, ich töte Scheherazade, die anpassungsfähige Gespielin und will gleichberechtigte offensive Frauen. Eine wütende Abrechnung mit dem Patriarchat. Revolutionär in der arabischen Welt. 
Busting the myth of the silent, submissive Arab woman killing Scheherazade, trying to create a new model. What reactions did you get to your work at the time? Well, obviously, which was very much expected, I had uh, the haters and, um, you know, the threateners, and I had the supporters. I mean, it's because... I mean, these issues were not only for me about uh, challenging uh, my own society and what they have been telling me to be or say or do since my early childhood, because this was, I think, depriving me of one of my most basic and sacred rights, which is my freedom. But it was also about challenging that the stereotypes in the West, you know, mm -hmm. and not all Arab women are mm -hmm. submissive or oppressed or veiled or I didn't park my camel outside and <laughs> came in, you know, all these images. And you, do, you, you think that it's a joke, but some people still think this way about Arab women until now. I mean, this is unfortunately why you need to uh, have have a healthy kind of curiosity mm -hmm. and why the media is important. It's important to, for the media to not just seek the story of the woman who has been abused by her husband and has been stoned to death because mm -hmm. poor veiled woman she was, she, she dared to love someone else, but also the successful Arab women and there are lots of them out there, lots of them. It's interesting, um, looking back at Jastad, that one of the biggest subscriber groups that you had was from Saudi Arabia. Um, obviously a country where big, big changes have been happening for women. Um, and that was, of course, cause for great optimism in, in recent months. The driving ban for women is supposed to be lifted on the 24th of this month. And then, very surprisingly, in the past weeks, a really harsh crackdown uh, on prominent Saudi women activists. Yeah. Multiple arrests and leading to an extremely troubling and contradicting uh, situation. We actually have a Saudi viewer in our uh, in our audience, so I'm coming back to you, Jumana, but I'm gonna go over to her and just introduce her for a second. Arafat, let's get you to stand up and give her a round of applause. I'm Arafat al Majid from Saudi Arabia. I'd like to know what you what are your thoughts on these developments in Saudi Arabia and how hopeful are you for, for, for real change for women in that country? Uh, because uh, of the the last um, laws that it happened in Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. uh, Crown Prince is supporting women now, mm -hmm. and we are so happy about that. Because if the laws come from up, mm -hmm. society and the culture will change. Mm -hmm. But if it's come from down to up, it will not happen in Saudi mm -hmm. Arabia. I'm talking about my country because the system in my country um, working like this. It is very difficult to m make move from down to up it okay. should become from up to down. On the other hand, it looks like he thought things were going just a little too quickly with all the crackdowns and, and arrests of, of Saudi women activists. So what does that tell us? Obviously, people were then suddenly... I don't think it will stop anything. It, it will continue. The, the, the liberation, the, the, yes, the, the it, opening it and the liberation. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I think what will women's. happen after a few days is uh, a very uh, clear uh, action to, to, to prove to all the world that the change in Saudi Arabia is real. Okay, yeah. so obviously optimism on your part, part, Arafat. Thank you very much for, for uh, contributing that. <laughs> I'd like to come back to you, Jumana. What are your thoughts on what's going on in Saudi Arabia and how hopeful are you? I mean, you're, you're, you're looking at the Arab world, uh, a, different, a different view on the Arab world, a different Arab country in Lebanon. Unfortunately, what's I'm not hopeful at all. You're not optimistic. No, because we I are witnessing uh, times where uh, religious uh, radicalism is on the rise. It's, you know, it's like a graph. It's up and down. Right. And now it's up. And you cannot mix religion with governance and expect good things. Mm -hmm. You cannot, I mean, this is a luxury that I cannot afford. I've been disappointed too many times. And the Arab world and most Arab countries are very far from this separation nowadays. And um, I mean, I do, I'm, I'm glad that finally women in Saudi Arabia can, can be in the 20th century. They're still not in 2018, but I'm glad they're at least able to, uh, to uh, uh, drive cars, but can you imagine that we are applauding a country just because it allowed people 
something so absurd and they're only allowed to women as as to drive a car why should we i mean they should have done this a long time ago i mean at least allow women to decide for themselves to make an autonomous what decision. they want to do how they when they want to travel how they want to live what i say is that as a woman you should be free to do whatever you want to do with your body if you want to wear hijab you should be free not to wear it if you don't want want to wear a hijab you should be supported in order not to wear it and what's going on, for example, now in Iran is very interesting because women are protesting in the street uh, to, uh, to, to protest against the fact that the, the, the hijab is, is, Man. is mandatory. And you even see women with hijab supporting their non-hijabi sisters in their right not to wear it. And that's something I try to very make, really make clear because there is something that is very patronizing when you see a woman who wears a hijab and you say, you know, to me, feminism means to be uncovered. Any comments on, on, on this uh, veil debate? Before we start, um, you know, um, defending the right of women to wear the veil, let us ask ourselves and ask them, were they forced to wear the veil mm. or did they sure. choose to wear the veil? My point is to say that Muslim women are not a monolith. If you wear yeah. a hijab in France, it doesn't have the same meaning as, as if you in, wear in, it in Saudi, in Saudi Arabia. Arabia. Uh, yes, I think it's very interesting. You know, India has the second largest Muslim yeah. population in the world after Indonesia. And Muslim women in India are covered and not covered and, you know, dress in any which way they please, there is hardly any place in the country where there is pressure. But there is a very interesting way in which Muslim women are claiming feminism. So I'm not as uh, claiming feminism from within religion. Mm. And I'm not as negative or as uh, pessimistic as you are uh, about even Saudi women uh, being able to drive, because I think one thing is what the state gives you, but the other is what comes up from the ground and what women fight for. And even a small right like that can actually be quite empowering to the women, and one can't dismiss what that means. Some of the struggles of Muslim women in India have been to reclaim Muslim shrines, which they want to be able to visit, which were only open to men, and they won that battle. But, you know, I want to come back briefly to what we began with, the Me Too movement, and the point that both of you were making, which is about how you get to see in the media the high-profile actors in this. Actually, to me, the movement against sexual violence, which is embodied partly in the Me Too movement, is really important worldwide because it has the potential to link the women's movement worldwide in a way that many issues have not done. In recent years, we have been very divided on many of our issues. Here's something that links us all together. But we have to remember, and the media, since we are talking in a media house with the media, have to remember that you can't only look at the big stories. You have to look at the smaller stories. And the fact that there's so much focus on Me Too in the United States and with, in Hollywood, but you forget everything else that's happening across the world is to me symbolic of the fact that it's a white woman-led movement and black women are forgotten in it, the fact that Arab women have disappeared from it, and the fact that things that are happening in our countries are just completely invisible including the fact that everywhere in the world women are stepping out and claiming public spaces much more than they were before, and that's really threatening. But, mm -hmm. but, and I was going to say that in the United States, clearly the whole Me Too and Time's Up movement was generated by celebrity, but it's actually had a fantastic trickle-down effect. Mm -hmm. There's been really millions of people empowered and also just the sheer outrage actually mm -hmm. um you know people in the united states are really really angry right now because the country really is being run by a misogynist thank you very much ellen for for that comment obviously I'd like to get to the situation in India where women are also fighting um, not only gender battles but also issues of class and caste and, and poverty and so on. And return to your statement, uh, the statement I opened with about you with the Indian women's movement. Uh, here in the West, our, our uh, perception of India is, is obviously highly polarized. Um, uh, on the one hand, you mentioned Bollywood, uh, romantic, exaggerated cliches, but then on the other hand, this shocking incidence of rape. Um, uh, what can you tell us there? 
there uh, to, to kind of uh, give us a more differentiated view of the reality of women in India that you see? Well, I think it's uh, actually, it's unfortunate that the image of India that gets projected is either of a terribly spiritual country, uh, which it is not, we are very materialistic uh, in many ways, or of a country that's terribly violent towards its, towards its women, and this is not to say violence does not exist, but uh, it is also a country which is actually fantastically a country full of opportunities for women, where women have really reached the top in many ways um, without any family backing. So the, you know, the entire banking industry is headed by women. We've had extremely powerful politicians. I mean, there's any number of things. And it's, again, uh, one has to look at things in a nuanced way. If you look at sexual violence statistically in the world, and if you look at UN statistics on uh, the rate per rape of 100,000 people, you'll be surprised to know that India is 1.2 on that scale. The United States is 27.8. The UK is 28 point something. Sweden is 63. South Africa is 120. I'm just citing the statistics that I remember. So what is it about India that creates this image? And I think there, it's a very complicated picture, but partly I think those of us who've been involved in the women's movement are to blame because we have kept the issue of sexual violence towards women on the public agenda. We will not let it go off the agenda because we want changes and we want it to be addressed. And the media has sided with us in very interesting ways. So every case gets into the papers. Mm -hmm. I don't want to take a nationalistic stance and pretend that we are great. We're not. <laughs> but I think you the are. picture is much more complicated. And I think that we need to understand also where women are placed culturally and all the kinds of beliefs and things which become sedimented over time and which become ways of imposing certain expected behaviors on women mm -hmm. and Bollywood fed into this right up to the gills mm -hmm. till recently when with the entry of new young women directors it began to change and now you're getting these amazing films which are made by women directors, produced by women, which star women. Telling female stories. So there, yeah, female. There is a recent mm -hmm. film called Vire the Wedding, which is about really women's sexual lives, and it's amazing. Mm -hmm. So, which brings me to the question of how artistic creation can actually help to break down mm -hmm. stereotypes. Um, we will talk about that just in one second, but first we're going to look at an exhibition of Indian women artists, and it's currently happening in Wolfsburg. Let's have a look. Armreifen. Gebrannt zu Ziegeln. Sie stammen von geschändeten Frauen. Death Room, taubes Zimmer. Eine Installation der indischen Feministin Bharti Kerr. Daneben ihre Six Women, sechs Frauen. Körper aus Gips von Sexarbeiterinnen aus Kalkutta. Die Ausstellung Facing India in Wolfsburg präsentiert Arbeiten von sechs jungen indischen Künstlerinnen. Prakshta Potnis nutzt Kühlschränke als Kulisse. Die Küche, auch in Indien ein weiblich besetzter Raum, mit strikten Hierarchien und Regeln. Angehörige einer niederen Kaste können nicht einfach die Küche eines Brahmanen aus einer höheren Kaste betreten. Und Frauen, die gerade menstruieren, dürfen gar nicht in die Küche. Der rote Faden der weiblichen Kunstschau, Grenzen und deren Auflösung. Wie bei der Künstlerin Mithu Sen. Ihr Sammelsurium aus nachgebildeten Organen und Zähnen, eine Absage an alle Trennlinien zwischen Kasten, Ethnien und Geschlechtern. How strong is the cultural scene, uh, uh, women's position in, in the cultural scene in India in general? Young women artists in India are breaking taboos quite amazingly on issues of sexuality, on issues of religion and uh, doing some really fascinating work. I think a lot of young women are breaking these cultural stereotypes and creating new and different cultures which will not be silenced. Mm -hmm. And I think what becomes worrying and really dangerous, you spoke of religion, is when religion combines with political yeah. power mm -hmm. and fundamentalism to impose cultural taboos exactly. on women. And that's happening in India now. 
And it's very scary. Even in, in the in United, United States. States. Yeah, I mean, if you think about it, uh, the radical right feeds yes. the radical uh, uh, religion, uh, radical Religious Islam. Space. This is, what, this is uh. what I always say. And you think about it, the right is not pro-women. It's not pro-choice. It's not uh, pro-freedom. It's very uh, oppressive. So definitely, I would say that there is a tendency, even in the West, towards this, um, you know, uh, backlash. Backwards. Yeah, exactly. A, a, a roll back in yeah. a way. Yeah. 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 Okay, yeah. I'm very interested in the fact that you have some women who are claiming their religion to find sources in religion to to empower themselves. So that's interesting that they wouldn't, uh, you know, give the religion away in the hands of men, but saying, no, we, we have to claim it. Yeah. And to say that it have been interpreted for centuries, for, for even, you know, more than centuries by men. And now if we reread the whole history, we can have a femi feminist, a female interpretation of it and be at the center of its history. Ellen. Yeah, I think there's really no lack of women's artistic output and creativity. Mm -hmm. It's really, I think, an issue of the gatekeepers. And when museums open their minds up to exploring different kinds of artistic expression, looking for new artists, um, you know, it's a tremendously important thing. And it's interesting now coming to Germany, um, when I was named director of, this, of the Deutsche Film Museum in January, there was a story in Artnet News. This year, there's eight women who've been named directors of German museums. It's a record. But the headline was, still a glass ceiling because all of the women running museums are underpaid. I think getting people into these gatekeeper positions in every community, um, in every artistic organization, will change the way that people are encouraged and inspired and who gets access to telling their stories, because it's really about who's driving the narrative, who's in charge of telling their story. But who are the gatekeepers of religion? They are men. It's yes. the Pope, it's the sheikhs, exactly. it's the priests. So even if you try whatever you can in order to make reinterpretation and to say, this is wrong and you are not right and I can do whatever I want, they will still insist on putting their own stories out there and not in order not to give you the power that mm. you are claiming. So it's actually about power. It's yes. about who are the gatekeepers, not just in film or in culture, it's everywhere. Who are are the gatekeepers yes. of this of this of this world in politics it's the same you exactly. know you can like in my country there are now six deputies out of 128 deputies uh, six deputies are women but unless we have more women in politics we won't be able to have the laws that we are fighting for exactly. still in Saudi Arabia and in other places it is the men who are giving you what is your exactly. own right? No, but and this is bad. But they are I, giving it to you. But no, no, I, sorry, sorry, sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> you know, I, um, I want to just add a thing. It's not only about power. Of course it is. But it is also about strategy. So if you are in a position of powerlessness, and if you can only claim power in a very limited way, at least you must try to do that, of which course. is what is happening. And I think also I want to suggest also to you, Ellen, can we maybe rethink this whole question of the glass ceiling? Because mm -hmm. it seems to me that the glass ceiling is almost, I mean, it's always ever articulated in terms of money. Because who is mm -hmm. earning the larger amount of money mm -hmm. who's getting to the top? But in many professions like yours, like mine, many others, women are the ones who are controlling the content. They are the ones who are, so in publishing in India, for example, all the heads of, all the editorial heads are women. And I'm pretty sure this is the case in many places in the world. All the CEOs are men because they earn the money. Mm -hmm. But actually, what's more important, cash or thought and ideas? And in that, I think we've cracked that glass ceiling. We are there. I just Go wanted ahead. to add something about the fact that uh, I think that uh, being an activist, acting for equality and for justice is not asking for justice, it's just, you know, getting it. Taking it. And it's yeah. taking Claiming it. it. Exactly. It's taking it. Taking so them. it's challenging the structure of power. They would give you just a time yes, to silence you. To you know? silence you and, like to, the right and, to, to, look good, and to look good. <laughs> and to look good. But yeah. unfortunately, many women are 
and I'm not, I mean, again, I don't want to be pessimistic, but when you, many women are easily silenced because of different factors. I'm talking about, you know, uh, being intimidated into, into staying silent or uh, the social pressure to just don't make a big fuss about it. Don't uh, make a scandal out of it. All of these true, things. But, I mean, I hope you haven't heard them, but I have. I, no, I have. <laughs> it's true, but many are not. And I'm simply saying, turn your focus. Yes. Focus on the ones who are speaking out. No, I would like to poke those who are not speaking up in order to make okay. them speak up so that we become <laughs> we more numerous. <laughs> Ellen, you had a comment. Well, I was just going to circle back to what you were saying and just put the gender equality notion that, you know, there's a scale of economy in every industry and in artistic production and publishing or the film business. And what I would advocate is that if you're doing the same job, you should just be paid the same. Agree, yes. And of course, that's become a big issue, circling back to Me Too and Time's Up, is it's not just access to those jobs. It's if you're doing the same job, are you actually being paid the same? And there's been some scandalous numbers coming out mm -hmm. about fe female and male co-stars in mm -hmm. you know, American yeah. film mm -hmm. productions. Mm -hmm. um, and it's shaming people. And it's I really have to say that the, the process of bringing this to light mm -hmm. and bringing people out, mm -hmm. it, you know, calling them out is very, very effective. Um, I don't think that um, if it weren't for the shame of um, some of these high profile yes. media figures um, being accused in such a public way and all their friends and neighbors and their families know mm -hmm. exactly what they did, that shame is quite powerful, mm -hmm. um, and it's also happening as sort of on, a, on an economic shame sphere. Has been, you has know, been yeah. criticized. access yeah. to employment mm -hmm. and access to um, equal pay that gets us a seat at the table, and that means that we are we are Good represented yeah. in a yeah, broader way in the culture. So you are sitting at the head of the table at the German Film Institute. Um, just yeah. tell us what what are your next projects? What wh how has the discussion uh, everything we're talking about? affected how you plan to uh, conduct these five years of, of your first contract, I'll call it. Um, will women and women's representation in film be an issue for you? Oh, absolutely. And in fact, um, I've inherited an institution that was already very focused on that. And my previous direct, the previous director was a woman. Um, and there's strong women in all of the you know, department heads of that institution. So um, we're screening women's films on a regular basis. There's tremendous film festival activity where um, women's voices are being front and center, um, and the content of our exhibitions and the content of our collections um, is trying to overcome the historical gap. I mean, often people say there aren't enough you know, high profile, talented women filmmakers to elect into the academy, for example. Mm -hmm. um, they need to be given that opportunity and you need to find young filmmakers and you need to encourage mid-career filmmakers because many, many artists make a movie and then they don't end up getting another chance. Mm -hmm. that 10 years can go by before another project gets made. So it's finding filmmakers at every stage of their career and giving them a public forum, inviting them to speak to the audiences. Um, that's a very fundamental um, approach to um, also sharing world cultures. Our museum is involved in showing film from every corner of the globe. Um, and that's a major, major um, project for us is to make sure we're not only focused, you know, on one nationality or, or you know, one more mode of expression. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, Jumana, um, you've made the move into politics, which I mentioned earlier, and you're talking now about this, uh, the difference, uh, culture, politics. Uh, have, your, have your goals changed? In what way have they changed? And is, is there more acceptance for what you're bringing forward in Lebanon? Well, it's, it's not that my goals have changed. You know, I've been fighting for um, women's rights and human rights in general because it also, to me, it, I mean, feminism includes everything. Mm -hmm. It's about being a human being. Mm -hmm. It's about fighting for equal rights and opportunities for everyone. And, mm, I mean, uh, um, no matter what your race or sexuality or sexual orientation, etc., is. And um, this is very, I mean, all these matters, all these issues are very much linked in, in my part of the world and in Lebanon. So fighting for freedom of expression and fighting for um, equal rights, as much as fighting for the right of it for education for all kids, not just the rich kids get to go and get a good education. And this is also 
part of the problem because you know the masses are not having the opportunity to be aware to be enlightened to have what they need to have in order to uh, work their minds all of these pushed me to to go into politics but to me it's like a, a continuity with what I have been doing so far and I will never stop being a writer so. Okay, that's that's good to hear. First, let me come over to you, Rokaya. What, what's next on your agenda, and and in the context <laughs> of this incredibly complex? Uh... So I have I have a documentary in the pipe, but I'm still working on the on the following steps of a book that I co-authored with a it's a picture book that I co-authored with a photographer, which name is Afro, which is a picture book that is, that displays uh, people from um, women from African descent with natural Afro hair because it's something that we didn't have a chance to speak about beauty standards, but that's something that oppress uh, women, all women, and especially women that are very far from the white beauty standards. From the yes. accepted so, standards. Yes, exactly. So we have interviewed 100, more than 100, uh, 140 uh, people, uh, women from African descent about how they feel wearing natural hair. And the, the place that we have picked was Paris because it's my birthplace. And we have made an exhibition uh, based on the book, which, has, which, was quite, quite, which was quite a success in Paris. So it's moving to some other parts of France, uh, in Marseille, in the suburbs of Paris. And I hope that it will be, mo it will be moving even in Africa. So it's and publication date? The, publi the, 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 the book is available. It's okay. named Afro. And it's co-authored with Brigitte Sombier, photographer, and we have people from uh, the, the, the cultural spaces, uh, hip-hop artists, uh, the former minister of justice, uh, singers and people, you know, teachers, accountants, people who just... It's just, it's just a way to show that beauty includes everyone, in, including people who doesn't, who don't look like, you know, what you connect to beautiful women. Mm -hmm. When you when you Google beautiful women, all the women white, that you see are white women. You never see Asian women or black women. So I wanted to just change that narrative about beauty. Absolutely, stir things up and and get some more diversity. Urvashi, what what are your are your, uh, you've, you've been working for 35 years as a feminist, uh, just slogging away and achieving so much. What are your goals now having? Well, I mean, the simplest um, way to put it is my goal, I think all our goal is to change the world and uh, make it a more <laughs> inclusive world where women are respected, where everyone actually yeah. uh, has a right to a life of dignity and respect. It sounds like a big thing to say, but to me, that's what feminism is about. But more specifically within my publishing house in India, um, our uh, goal, our mandate, our immediate uh, priority is to focus as much as possible on the voices of marginalized women. Mm -hmm. So to look at low caste women, to look at queer women, to look at Muslim women, women of different minorities, to look at trans women and to capture their stories mm -hmm. so that we can in some way nuance the story of India and Indian women by including all their diversity and not only focusing on the voices of women like me who come from mm -hmm. privilege and who are educated. And that's really, we can do that in the few years that I as an older woman have left to publish, I think I'll be happy. I know we have different levels of optimism on this uh, panel, but just a, a quick answer from all of you, just a, a really short one. Are we on the verge of a new, with all the friction that we've just been discussing, are we on the verge of a new zeitgeist, Ellen Harrington? I certainly hope so. I, I couldn't take it if we weren't moving in the right direction in some way. Oh, yes, Jumana. definitely. Yes. Optimism, there it is. Oh, I am optimistic. I'm just, I'm just, just uh, poking outraged. the guy. Exactly. I like outraged. to poke. <laughs> okay, yeah. Yes, we are, especially because because we have new means to connect. We have never been able to connect in such a way uh, as today. So that's something that makes me positive and optimistic. Good, and lots of hope. Obviously, we wouldn't be doing what we're doing if we didn't have hope. Or well, Vashi, sure. a final word from yeah, you about know. your optimism. I don't know what we are on the verge of, but whatever it is, it's really important. And it's going to change reality in very fundamental ways, and we had better be ready for it. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much to all of our panelists. We will be ready for it. Urvashi Butalia, Ellen Harrington, Zumana Haddad, Rokaya Diallo, thank you very much for being with us at the Global Media Forum for this very interesting and lively discussion. And thank you to all of our audience. Give yourselves a round of applause. <laughs>
Women in culture, obviously, working at the forefront for many, many centuries, and they will continue to do so. A lot of optimism in the room here, and we are on the verge of something, possibly a new zeitgeist. <laughs> Thanks for joining us.